Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing today? All right. Well, I am glad to hear that everybody is doing good. It is so good to see each and every one of you today uh, as we come to worship God. What a beautiful opportunity that we have. As well, I want to greet those of you who are in our mask only area and who are watching online as a church. We are so grateful for the opportunity to be able to have some of these different ways that we might be able to worship together uh, in spirit and in truth. If you are a guest, I want to also offer a special greeting to you guys. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. We are grateful for the opportunity to get to know you. And I want to point out that in our bulletin, there is a slip of paper with a perforated edge. Uh, if you would tear that off and place that in the offering plate as it's passed by later on during the service, this would give us as a church the opportunity to get to know you a little bit more and to pray specifically for your needs. And so please, if you would, place that in the offering plate later on during the service. This morning in Sunday school, we had 114, which is an amazing number. We're so grateful to be able to have this, the, our Sunday schools up and running because it gives us this opportunity to get into smaller groups and study the Word of God and get in better communities together. And so we're grateful for the opportunity to be able to continue to offer that. And I encourage you, if you are not a part of a Sunday school, to get plugged in to a Sunday school. We have church council this Wednesday at 6 p.m. for those of you who are involved with that. And this weekend, we have our Biblical Womanhood Retreat. If you are a young lady aged 7th grade to 12th grade, I encourage you to be a part of that. What a beautiful opportunity and privilege that our church has to be able to speak into the lives of our young women who really need to be heard what it looks like to be a woman based on what the Bible says. It's important, it's, and we want to encourage you, if you are a woman age 7th, through 12th grade, to be involved and go to that, just to hear from what the Word of the Lord says. We're also starting this week our Annie Armstrong offering. We are trying to raise $3,500 for Annie Armstrong, and this is an important thing for us because it gives us the opportunity to support our missionaries within, uh, within our nation, which is huge. Now let's prepare our hearts for the Word of the Lord um, and prepare us to praise Him the way that we are called to praise Him. Romans 8, verse 19 through 21 says, For the creation eagerly waits with anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that creation itself will be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. We live in a world that is eagerly awaiting Jesus Christ's return. We see that from this passage, yet it struggles with decay and brokenness and sin. But how glorious will it be when all of that is set free? And when we get to see creation as it is supposed to be based on the revelation of God and based on the will of God and the glory of God and the joy of God, I encourage us to think those things through and to, to ponder those moments as we prepare our hearts to worship Him Wayne, if you would come and pray for us as we get started with our service. Let us pray. Father, we humbly bow before you, recognizing you as the true and living God. Father, we would ask that you would bless every aspect of our service, Father. Father, that you would bless Brother Robbie as he brings the message. And Father, if there's one here today that doesn't know you as their personal Savior, Father, we just pray that the Holy Spirit might move that individual, either to make that announcement either public or private. Father, again, we just thank you for your grace. For we ask this in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. First hymn this morning, tell the good news.
Um, this song is traditionally sung at Easter time, but in light of today's world where Christianity, religion, and God are under constant attack, um, I felt the need that this would be appropriate time to sing the song, and it's entitled Rise Again. the nails in my hands laugh at me where you stand go ahead and say
Amen. Thank you, Brenda. And you've told us and shown us exactly the reason why we're here. If it were not for Jesus' resurrection, the fact that he is still alive, there'd be no reason for any of us to be here today. It makes all the difference in the world. Well, this morning's sermon is the final sermon in a series of sermons we've been calling, Who is Jesus to You? Now, that's been in conjunction with your Sunday school lessons, <clears throat> and uh, next week we're going to depart from that for a quarter, and then we'll resume. Uh, but uh, we've been in the Gospel of Luke, and we've allowed the Gospel of Luke in this series of sermons to present right information to us about Jesus so that we could have a right relationship with Him. And it's only fitting that in this final sermon, uh, the sermon title is the same as the series. Who is Jesus to you? This is based upon Luke's gospel, the ninth chapter, verses 18 through 27. So if you've got your Bibles, I encourage you to open to that passage of Scripture. We're going to be looking more closely at these verses in just a few moments. Now what we're going to find there in that passage of Scripture is that Jesus asks this very question of the disciples. He starts out by mentioning the crowds and he asks his disciples, who do the crowds say that I am? But then he goes to the disciples and says to them, or asks them, who am I to you personally? Now we're going to go ahead and, and get to the application of that right now. Jesus is here. And he is asking you and me this morning the same question. Who is Jesus to you personally? Have you settled that issue in your life? Now listen, if you're here this morning and you say, I am a believer, I am a Christian, I've been born again, put that in whatever uh, phrasing you want. But if you make that claim, if you're asked the question, who is Jesus to you? There is only one right answer. And we're going to put that answer up on the screen here for you. You see, if, if you're a believer and you're asked, who is Jesus to you, the right response is this. He is my Savior, and I will follow Him no matter the cost. Now, you can say that in different ways. You can say that you've been born again or uh, that you've been saved. You can also say that you're going to live a life that's glorifying to Him, but however you phrase it, it contains these two components. You've come to the place where you've surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. He has saved you from your sins, and because of that, you're going to live for Him. Now, I want to ask you right now, is this who Jesus is to you? I want you to think about that this morning. Is this who Jesus really is to you? If you're here this morning, if you're listening in some other kind of way, if at the end of our sermon time you've come to the realization this is really truthfully not who Jesus is, we're going to be encouraging you to make a decision that will allow Him to be your Savior and be the reason for you to live, no matter the cost. These verses describe that in detail. So we're going to look at these verses and let them demonstrate to us what it looks like for us to truly have Jesus as our Savior and to live for Him and follow Him no matter the cost. So you've got your Bibles open to Luke, the ninth chapter. We're going to look, first of all, at verses 18 through 20. And in those verses, we're going to discover this truth. If Jesus is your Savior, you will confess Him without hesitation. Let's look at verses 18 through 20 and see how that demonstrates it for us. While he, and this is Jesus, so while Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowd say that I am? They answered, John the Baptist, others, Elijah, still others that one of the ancient prophets has come back. But you, he asked them, who do you say that I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. Now, as we said just a moment ago, if Jesus is truly your Savior, you're going to confess Him without hesitation. Now, He asked the, the disciples a question. Now, they had had plenty of time to be with the crowds in that community. Previously, in verses 1 through 6, we see there that uh, He had sent them on a mission trip. And so, the disciples had been out amongst the people in all the different surrounding communities. And then after that, right above here in this passage of Scripture, Jesus feeds the 5,000. But who is it that goes through and collects all the remnants? Well, it's the disciples, and they've had time to talk with the crowds. So Jesus asked the question, who do the crowds say that I am? And so the disciples reported what they had heard. Some say you're John the Baptist, or Elijah, or an ancient prophet. 
But you know, I think we can very easily see that while that was a good question to ask, Jesus was really after the second question. That's what he really wanted to get to. He wanted to make sure that the disciples had a right view of him. And so he asked them, but who am I to you personally? And you know what? It's no surprise that it's Peter who steps up and answers that. I don't know if you've ever uh, followed Peter much uh, throughout the Gospels, but Peter was a bold, brash man of action, wasn't he? And there were many times when Peter uh, acted before he thought. Uh, and, And that was sometimes a good thing and sometimes it wasn't a good thing. For instance, do you remember when the disciples were on the boat out on the Sea of Galilee and there was a storm and Jesus came walking on the water? Who was it that swung his legs over the side of the boat and said, let me walk to you, Jesus? It was Peter, right? And that was a good thing. I mean, that was a, that was, I mean, he walked on water for crying out loud. But let's also remember that when the mob came to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, who was the first one to draw his sword and draw blood? It was Peter, wasn't it? And we can go to other examples, but I want to draw out from this passage of Scripture this truth, that Peter, having come to understand the truth about Jesus, he confessed Jesus without hesitation. It almost flows that way as we read it. Who do you say that I am? Peter, real quickly, you are God's Messiah. You know, I don't know about your Bible, but in, in my Bible, right above this passage of Scripture, there's a heading there. It says, Peter's Confession of the Messiah. Does your Bible have something like that there? I think the word confession is a great word there. Peter may have still been struggling with all the details, but he was quick to step forward and say, this is who Jesus is to me. He is God's Messiah. Let's talk about that answer for a minute, God's Messiah. You know, the word Messiah means anointed. It also is the word for Christ. But now in that day and time, people can be anointed for all different kinds of reasons. You could be anointed just because you showed up for somebody's house for supper, you know. But Peter made it plain. He said to Jesus, Jesus, you are God's Messiah. You are God's anointed. Peter was establishing a very important truth about how he viewed Jesus. He said, Jesus, I know who you are. You're the one that God sent to be the Savior of the world. That's who you are, and that's who you are to me. When Jesus came to this earth, he came as the anointed one sent from God. And Peter said, I confess that. You know, the word confess is an interesting word because what it really means is to own the truth. Think about that for a second. When you confess something, what you're really doing is owning the truth. When I was a kid and I did something that I shouldn't have done and my parents found out about it, they would talk to me about it. You know what they wanted me to do? They wanted me to confess. In other words, they wanted me to own the truth. Peter says, I own this truth about you, Jesus. You are God's Messiah. You're the one that God sent to save the world. And he did it without hesitation. You know, when we are ready and willing to confess Jesus Christ without hesitation, that's an indication of a firm commitment to him. Would you agree with that? The person who is ready and able and quick to step step forward and say, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, that is a person who is doing that based upon a firm commitment that they have made regarding Jesus Christ. Those of you who know a little bit about history know that way back in the year 1519, that's a long time ago, Hernan Cortez sailed some ships to the New World with 600 men. And when he landed in the New World, his 600 men got off of those sailing ships, they got onto the shore, and then Cortez ordered all of those ships to be destroyed. Now he was sending a strong message to his 600 men. Men, we're here to stay. There's no turning back. There's no getting on the ships and going back. We're here to stay. Yet in two years he had accomplished his mission. He had succeeded in the conquest of the Aztec Empire. Now, church, I'm just simply saying that's the kind of commitment that leads to confessing Jesus without hesitation. If you truly have Jesus as your Savior, you've made a commitment to Him in which you're saying, Lord, I am all in. There's no turning back. There's no going back to my old way of life. And I will confess you with my life and with my words without hesitation because of who you are to me. 
We own that truth, and when we own that truth, that truth is that He is our Savior, and we will confess Him without hesitation. Now let's look at verses 21 through 22. In those verses, we learn this truth. If Jesus is your Savior, you will believe in Him without confusion. Let's look at verse 21 and 22. But he strictly warned and instructed them to tell this to no one, saying, It is necessary that the Son of Man suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, be killed, and be raised the third day. Now, if we're going to claim Jesus as our Savior, we're going to believe in Him and do so without confusion. We're going to have the facts straight about Him. You know, back then, there were a lot of wrong views about the Messiah. People had views about the Messiah that leaned towards the political definition of the Messiah. Now, Jesus says here in verse 20 to the disciples, don't tell anyone that I'm the Messiah. Why did he do that? Because he didn't want people taking their false views and applying them to him. That would promote confusion. And when Jesus began to do the things that showed that he truly was the real Messiah, it was going to promote even more confusion. So he said to his disciples, don't tell people that I'm the Messiah. They're going to take their wrong views and place them on me. And it will be harmful to his identity with them and his mission. So he said, don't tell them about it. But then on the heels of that, he wanted to make sure that his disciples had the correct definition of the real, true Messiah. He wanted them to know that the popular view of the Messiah, this political figure, was far from the truth. And so in verse 21, in a nutshell, he outlines the identity of the Messiah and the mission of the the Messiah. Look at it, if you would, again, at verse 22. It's necessary that the Son of Man suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, be killed, and be raised the third day. This was in direct violation or or in direct contrast with the popular view of the Messiah. Most Jews believed that the coming Messiah was going to be a king. But if we go back here in the book of Luke, we know that Jesus was born under very humble circumstances. There was no palace, was there? And here Jesus says that the Son of Man will suffer many things. Popular belief about the Messiah was that the Messiah would not only be a king, but he would be a strong and courageous leader. Jesus says, me, the Messiah, the Son of Man, that's not what I'm going to be. In fact, I'm going to suffer many things. The popular view of the Messiah was also that he would be hailed and accepted by all. Everyone would receive him with excitement. But Jesus said the real Messiah, that's him, Jesus, what does he say there? would be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes. A popular belief of the Messiah was that he would reign and reestablish the nation of Israel. Jesus says, no, the real Messiah will be killed. And we know that Jesus was condemned as a criminal and was executed. Popular belief among people about the Messiah was that they would, uh, the, the Messiah would lead the nation of Israel to defeat Rome. And reestablish them as a nation. Jesus says, yes, there will be a victory won. But it will not be over Rome. It will be a victory over death. And he said, the real Messiah will be raised the third day. And when the real Messiah wins victory over death, he will give that to those who place their faith in Jesus Christ. So we see here Jesus is saying to his disciples, here's the real definition of the real Messiah. Now, I want to make sure that you're seeing this. So, if we're going to believe in Him without confusion, we've got to believe in Him in two ways. We've got to believe the right things about His identity, and we've got to believe the right things about His mission. Everybody with me? If we're going to believe in Him without confusion, we have to believe the right things about Him and His mission. So, let's be clear about who Jesus is and what He came to do. You see... If we were to stop people out on the street and talk to them and just ask the question, who is Jesus? They might come up with answers like, well, he was a good man, or he was a prophet, or they may come up with even more wilder things than that. But I want to say this to you. Jesus was more than a good man, amen? He was more than just a prophet. 
We've got to have the correct view of Jesus. And you've heard me say these things before, but listen, for you and me personally, as we think about our relationship with him, we've also got to say that Jesus is more than just a tool in our toolbox. He's not the one that we turn to when we get in trouble, and then when we get out of trouble, we ignore him for the rest of the time until we get in trouble again. He is more than a tool in your toolbox. Jesus isn't fire insurance to keep you out of hell. Jesus is not here to give you a free ticket to heaven. Jesus didn't come to be with you and me so that you could find a better job. Jesus didn't come to be with us so that we could pray to him on game day and ask him to help our team win today. Jesus did not come to be with us to improve or save your marriage or to take away all your doubts and fears or to make your life easier. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, who came to die on the cross for the sins of the world, to pay the price for our sins so that we, by placing our faith in Him, can have a right relationship with God. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. That is who He is. And that is why He came. Now listen, church. I've been a pastor long enough to come to the realization that we can say that we believe certain things about Jesus, but then we can go off and act like we don't believe those things. Amen or oh me. Now church, this might sting a little bit, but we'll do it quick and move on. It's like pulling a band-aid off, okay? You see, if we truly believe the truth about Jesus, about who he is and what his mission is, our path of following him will be without confusion. What we say we believe will also match what we do. Let me give you an example. Let's suppose you have a friend. You're a believer, but your friend is not a believer. But your friend begins to ask you questions about what it means to be a Christian. They begin asking about Jesus and how they can be a Christian. If you're confused about who Jesus is and his mission, a confused response might be, hold on just a minute, let me get you the phone number of the preacher and you talk to him. That's a confused response. You know what a clear response would be if you truly understand who Jesus is and he's your Savior? You will tell your friend about Jesus. Amen? Here's another example. The ABC Church, Baptist Church down the road, every Wednesday night, they gather for a prayer meeting. That's what they call it. It's prayer meeting. They're going to pray as a church. And that's a great thing. It's a wonderful thing for the church to come together and pray corporately. But remember, what do we know about Jesus and his mission? Jesus is the Savior, and he died to save lost people. So when the ABC Church gets together, you know what they pray about almost every time? They pray about helping people who are physically sick. They pray for people who are hurting physically. Wait a minute, hold on a minute. What do we know about Jesus? Did Jesus come and say, I've come so that people will never get cancer? I've come so that people will never get sick? Is that what Jesus said? No. No, he said, I've come to heal people spiritually. If you're confused about who Jesus is and what he came to do, then ABC Church that's over here praying for sick people and that's all they pray for, they're confused. The right response is in that prayer meeting, they should be praying for people who don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now say amen. amen. One more example. A church gets a large financial donation, just out of the blue, a lot of money. That church, if they're confused about who Jesus is and his mission, they might say, hey, let's take that money and put it in a savings account and we'll just hold on to it for a rainy day. But if they're clear about who Jesus is and his mission, the clear response will be, let's find a way where we can strategically use that money to tell more people about Jesus Christ. Now listen, I'm just here to tell you, what you truly believe is going to eventually show up in what you do. And there should not be confusion amongst God's people. We should not be confused about who Jesus is or why he came. We study about it every week. 
We study about it in our Sunday school classes. You hear sermons about it. There should be no confusion. But I'm here to tell you, church, we've got to get to the place where what we believe begins to show us what we should be doing. If Jesus is your Savior, you will believe in Him without confusion. Now we're going to look at verses 23 through 27. Because in those verses, we learn this. If Jesus is your Savior, you will follow Him without shame. Let's look at verses 23 through 27. Then He said to them all, If anyone wants to follow after Me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow Me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of Me will save it. For what does it benefit someone if he gains the whole world? and yet loses or forfeits himself. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and that of the Father and the holy angels. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. If Jesus is truly your Savior, you're going to follow him without Shame. Now that idea of shame is introduced there in verse 26. And I want us to focus on verse 26 again real quickly. Jesus said, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him. Now in that particular verse there, that word that's being translated ashamed, it means more than just being embarrassed. Okay? In that particular verse, Jesus is talking about how you live your life and how you follow him. And so he's saying, if your fear of what people might think about you or say about you or what might do to you causes you to live your life in a way where you show the world you have no connection to Jesus, he says, that means that you're ashamed of me. You've rejected me. And Jesus goes on to say, so if you live your life letting the whole world that you want to have nothing to do with Jesus, Jesus says, when I come back, I'll give you what you've asked for. You will have nothing to do with me for the rest of eternity. Let's make sure we have this plainly fixed in our minds. There is no such thing as an undercover Christian. No such thing. This whole idea that I can be a believer in Jesus, but I can live my life under the radar. I don't have to do anything that shows anybody my, my relationship to him, that he means anything to me. There's no such thing. What we are to do is to follow Jesus and to follow him without shame. So how do we do that? Let's go to verse 23. Verse 23 gives us three steps. It's about as simple as it can be presented. Verse 23. Then he said to them all, if anyone wants to follow after me, all right, did you hear that? If you want to follow after Jesus, he's getting ready to tell you how to do it. If anyone wants to follow after me, here's the first step, let him deny himself. Now, we don't have to look this up in a commentary or need a theologian to understand what that phrase means. If you deny yourself, that means your needs, your wants, even your personal rights Take a back seat to serving God and serving other people. That's what that means. You're going to put other people, you're going to put serving God before yourself. You're denying yourself. You're taking a back seat. As John the Baptist said, he must increase and I must decrease. And that's our position. Now, look, I can't, we can't sugarcoat this in any kind of way. Jesus said, if you want to follow me, the first step on the path is deny yourself. So I've got to ask you this question. Is that a truth in your life? Do you deny yourself? Because the path that leads to him begins with that step. What about your spouse? Do you deny yourself with regards to your spouse? How about your friends? How about your, the people that you go to school with? Do you deny yourself and, and place their needs and what's going on in their lives before what's going on in your own? Listen, if we live our lives in such a way where we do not deny ourselves, Jesus says, then you're ashamed of me. I, I, we can't, th there's no other way of looking at it, church. It, it's black and white. So the first step is to deny yourself. 
The second step, look at it in verse 23. If anyone wants to follow after me, and I hope that's you, let him deny himself. Here's the second step. Take up his cross daily. Now, in our day and time, we've taken the cross and turned it into a piece of jewelry. It's shiny and smooth. But back then, the cross meant only one thing, death. That's what it meant. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you have to be willing to experience death daily. That word daily is in there, isn't it? Every day. Now, for you and me today, for us to be willing to take up our cross, in other words, to willing to be experienced, for us to experience death, for us to be willing to suffer in the name of Christ, they, we have to make some important decisions. So let's be clear here. Uh, last night when you got up out of bed in the middle of the night and stubbed your toe on the way to the bathroom, you weren't bearing your cross then, okay? That, that, that wasn't bearing your cross, taking up your cross. You, 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 you've got problems at work or financial problems. That you, you're not bearing your cross. That, that may be suffering, but it's not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about suffering for his sake. He's talking about suffering because you claim the name of Jesus Christ, because you have claimed him as your Savior. So that means for you and me, if we're going to take up our cross daily, we're going to die to self. We're going to die to the worldly temptations that are out there. We're going to die to the worldview that's being presented to us. We're going to die to the value system of the world that tells us that all these things that are unimportant really are important. For crying out loud, when it comes to social all the social platforms that are out there, when it comes to Facebook and all that kind of stuff, when, when you look at your news feeds and you see all these things on your phone, do we really have to know what's going on in Brad Pitt's life? Do we really? Is it really that important that we find out that there's a 14-foot alligator down in Florida? All these things that are being presented to you as if you're supposed to care about them. We care about these things that are so insignificant, but when it comes to the cause of Jesus Christ, when it comes to living for Him and showing the world that we love Him, we say that doesn't matter. We're so enamored with the world that we can't see the cause of Christ as it stands right before us. Social media is not inherently evil. I'm just simply saying that we've got to keep the main thing the main thing. And if you're allowing the worldly influence that is being perpetrated against you through social media or any other outlet that gets you off the course towards Jesus, you've got to put that away. You've got to deny yourself and put him first. Here's the third step. If anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily. Here's the third step. And follow me. You know, church, to follow Jesus is to follow his example, and it's to follow his words. If you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to look and see what he did, you're going to listen to what he said, and it's going to make a difference in your life. Now, church, we can sum all that up in one word it's called obedience. That's what it's called. If we're going to follow Jesus, we're going to obey his example, and we're going to obey his words. You know, the best place for us to see Jesus' example, the best place to hear Jesus' words, is in the Bible. So that means we've got to take the Bible seriously. Now, with that in mind, I'm not trying to be prophetic or anything like that, but I am sure that there is someone this morning, within the sound of my voice, that needs to take these words I'm about to say seriously. Love your enemies. Now when Jesus said that, he meant it. When Jesus said, love your enemies, he wasn't just giving us some kind of philosophical, philosophical view that he held. He's saying this is part of following him. There is someone here this morning, maybe a couple here this morning, that needs to take God's word seriously, that needs to hear this. Husbands, you are to love your wife like you would yourself. There is someone here this morning that needs to hear that. Wives, 
There's, some, there's a wife here this morning that needs to hear the rest of that verse. And a wife is to respect her husband. That's what Jesus said in his word. If we're going to follow him, we're going to obey his example, and we're going to obey his word. I know that there is someone here this morning within the sound of my voice that needs to take God's word seriously when God's word says, consider others as more important than yourself. When he said that, he meant it. Listen, church, we're talking about following Jesus. We're talking about following him without shame. I want to make sure that you've got this clearly in your mind. Think of it this way. Jesus is standing over there, and I'm here. If I want to be with Jesus, if I want to go with Jesus, there is a path that leads to him. It's from this spot to that spot. And you know how I get from this spot to that spot? I deny myself. I take up my cross, and I follow him. And when I do that, guess where I end up at? I end up with Jesus. But listen, if we take another path, any other path, if we take the path of human secularism, if we take the path of selfishness, if we take the path of just doing whatever we want to do and going along with the world's desires and influence, if we take any of those paths, we won't end up at Jesus. We'll take a detour this way, we'll take a detour that way, but it will not lead to Jesus. Jesus presented it as about as clearly as it can be presented. If you want Jesus as your Savior, the path begins by denying yourself. You take the next step by taking up your cross daily, and then you do all you can to follow his example and his words through obedience. You do that, and you will follow him without shame. But listen. If we fool ourselves, if we lie to ourselves and say, oh, I'm following Jesus, but I'm just not letting anybody know. Or I'm going to say I follow Jesus, but, you know, when I have to make a hard decision, I'm going to make a decision that's really in my best interest, not in the best interest of other people. We've got to ask ourselves, are we living a life that shows that we're ashamed of him? My friend, I don't want you to do that. I'm encouraging you not to do that. Live in a way where Jesus is lifted up and glorified in your life. Without shame. Without being afraid of what other people might say or think or do. You know, when we talk about following Jesus and the sacrifice that it can create and the perhaps hard work that it might produce in our lives. When we talk about that, many times we talk about it kind of in an unpleasant way. We, we know that it's something we've got to do, maybe, but we, we really, if we're going to be honest, we, we say this is really a hard stuff, and, it, and it's, it's almost optional in our minds. And if that's what you're thinking here this morning about following Jesus, I want to take a few moments and see if I can change our perspective, all right? Last week... Maybe you heard this, maybe you didn't, but last week, a young woman named Jasmine Harrison set a new world record. She was the youngest woman to row a boat across an ocean. I can't even imagine rowing a boat across a pond. She rowed a boat all by herself across an ocean. She was the youngest woman to do it. She set that world record last week. Now, it took her two months to do it. She had to row 12 hours a day. That averaged out to 20,000 strokes a day. Can you even think about 20,000 of these? Twice during that two-month journey across the ocean, her boat was capsized by a big wave that hit it. And one time she nearly collided with a big ship, drilling ship that was out there at 4 o'clock in the morning. But in spite of all of that, she set the record, the youngest woman to row across an ocean. Now let me ask you a question. Do you feel sorry for her for setting that goal and achieving it? 
Do you feel sorry for her? Poor thing, she set a world record. No, you know, when somebody achieves something like that, aren't we glad for them? Don't, don't we applaud them? Look, I, I follow the Olympics pretty regularly, and maybe you do too. I have never seen anybody up there on the platform with a bronze, silver, or gold medal who gets the medal and then says, man, I sure wish I hadn't worked out and, so that I could get this medal. I sure wish I hadn't been to the gym. I sure wish I hadn't conditioned my body. I sure wish I hadn't exercised. They don't say that. In fact, when they look at that medal, they say, I'm glad that I conditioned my body, that I worked so hard. Why are they glad? Because the metal makes it worth it. Church, when we follow Jesus, yes, there's going to be self-sacrifice. And we're going to have to make some difficult decisions. But I'm here to tell you, it's worth it. And we've got to get our eyes off of what we think is sacrifice and put our eyes plainly upon our destination, which is Jesus Christ. Because he's worth it. This morning I need to ask you a very simple question, one I've been asking you for three months. Who is Jesus to you? Not asking what the Bible necessarily says about him, although that's important. We're not asking you to give the textbook or Sunday school answer. We're asking you to respond with a confession, just like Peter did. We're asking you to say, to me personally, this is who Jesus is. Now again, there's only one right answer. If you want to follow Jesus, if you want to be in a right relationship with him, the right answer is, he's my Savior, and I'm going to follow him no matter the cost. Is that who Jesus is to you? If not, we're inviting you this morning, during our hymn of invitation, to come forward as we sing, and to let me or Charles know, I want to surrender my life to Jesus Christ I want to follow him. I want him to save me, to forgive me of my sin. And I'm going to live for him from this day forward, no matter what the cost is. If you need to make that decision here this morning, we're encouraging you to do it. But believer, if you're here today, you're already claiming the title of being a Christian for you this morning. The challenge is, are you following him no matter the cost? You see, again, Jesus said, if you live as if you're ashamed of me, when I come back, I'll be ashamed of you. Are you truly living in a way where people who come in contact with you know in a very short period of time that you're a follower of Jesus Christ? Are you serving him, following him, no matter the cost? If not, we're inviting you to rededicate your life to Christ this morning. I'm going to ask our musicians if they would to move to their place because we're going to sing that hymn of invitation here in just a few moments. And it's your opportunity here to make a decision. Who Jesus is, his identity and his mission will always be the same. It will never change. The only thing that can change is your response to it. He is the Messiah. He did die on the cross for the sins of the world. That took place and it's true and it's real and it will stand for all time. The only thing that can change is how you respond to that truth. And we're inviting you this morning to make decisions based upon what Jesus Christ did and who he is. Won't you come? Won't you do business with God here today? Won't you make that decision to trust him? Steve, come and lead us in this invitation hymn. And if God is speaking to you here this morning, we invite you to come.
Amen. God bless you for being here this morning. We pray that the Lord will bless you this week and that you'll have many opportunities to follow Him, to show people that you truly have a right relationship with Him. And we pray that you'll take advantage of those opportunities as they come. We're going to pray and then we'll sing and be dismissed. So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we do thank you for your word that shows us the truth about who you are. Lord, help us to respond properly and correctly. Lord, we know that we're going to make mistakes and there are going to be times when we fall short of what you've called us to be and do. But Lord, we also know that when that happens, you want us to come to you and confess that and make things right with you so that we can again follow you and be on mission with you. Lord, I thank you for these people here this morning and the ways that they show on a regular basis their love and their desire to follow you. Lord, help us corporately as a church to make good decisions that will help us to do that very thing. Now watch over each person here this morning and the families that they represent. Lead us, guide us, direct us. Help us, Lord, to be faithful in all that we say and do. And we ask all of this in the name of Christ. Amen. We close with Jesus as the sweetest name I know.